Good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Last time I was here was in the late 70s. So that's uh, almost 40 years ago. Was I in for a shock when I arrived last night? Um, I came here, as I will come back to later, to master plan a place called Robina. Robina after Robin Lowe, a Singapore shipbuilder who wanted to create a brave new world here. Well, much has happened since then. Uh, my quest as an architect has really followed two paths. They're intertwined, but they are nevertheless two, uh, focus, two points of focus. The first, which begins with my work in Habitat, is focusing on how to humanize megascale, how to deal with density, congestion, um, essentially, how do we deploy towers, high-rise buildings, to create urbanism, and how do we create the quality of life within them that we seem to uh, react to so negatively. And so it's been the kind of invention of typology or reinvention of typology. And yet, also in parallel, particularly as I started working in the city of Jerusalem in the rebuilding of the historic city in the early 1970s, I became obsessed almost to the, on, uh, to the question of can you build authentic contemporary architecture in harmony with the cultural heritage of a historic city? Which led me to the greater question of how do we create an architecture which belongs? Not one which you import, preconceived, but one that grows out of the culture, the climate, the history, the way of life, uh, the specificity of design, what makes it unique to a place, to a program. And that, that led to a number of institution projects through the 80s and the 90s where not much work was happening in the realm of housing, such as the Holocaust Museum in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Sikh National Museum in the Punjab, the National Gallery of Canada, the United States Institute of Peace, all, all complexes, very specific and culturally and symbolically loaded, which I will not have the opportunity to talk about tonight, because today, this morning, because I thought, actually for me it is tonight, um, uh, because it seems to me that the theme, edge, has to do with the foundation of urbanism in this contemporary era. And so I'd, I'd like to take you on a, a journey of specific exploration of these issues with one new emphasis thrown into it as we talk about recent years, and that is the public realm. One of the, uh, one of the troubling elements in cities made of towers is that we are yet to find a way to create uh, the public realm, an urbanism that creates the public realm with the towers as a fun fundamental building block of the city. And it seems to me that this new typology of mixed-use towers with giant podiums at their base are in some ways a kiss of death to urbanism. And I will try to explore that further as we get into the evolution of this, uh, these projects. Um, what do I do? There we go. So, 1959, um, I was awarded a traveling fellowship by the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation, together with one student from each school of architecture in Canada to study housing in North America. And as you would expect in the, in the 59, much of what we saw were suburbs, Levitt towns, as, uh, as they were known, uh, with the big migration move to the suburbs from the cities and people uh, departure of the cities in large numbers. And on the other side of the spectrum, we were building high-rise 
public housing projects. This was the era where public housing was still in vogue. This is the famous Chicago uh, complex. Uh, and we as students visited these buildings and we recognized two things, that nobody who lived in them wanted to be there and that the quality of life in them was really oppressive. And if that was what urban housing meant, then no, no wonder that middle-income and upper-middle-income families rather would go to the suburbs. But what troubled me personally was that this was not some expedient bureaucracy at work, but it was really the realization of the major architectural ideological movement of the time. The modern movement, this is Hilversheimer's The Ideal City of 1923, with its rows of identical buildings separated by a highway system. And to me, as a young architect, what seemed a betrayal, Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, which was at the time uh, tooted as the answer to all our urban ills. To me, it seemed like a bureaucratic stacking of identical apartments in what was called around internal streets, which seemed to me like dark corridors. And so when I came back, I set as my thesis at McGill to try and rethink the typology of the apartment building, to try and do so through prefabrication, to try and create the quality of life of the house in a multi-level structure. We talked about high density. In retrospect, looking at this density, I smile, coming from Shanghai and Singapore and other Hong Kong. But we talked about density and trying to get the quality of life of a house. Each unit had its own identity. It had its own garden. It had access from a street. Uh, in time, this is a more recent photograph, the patina of life, the deployment of the outdoor spaces, the growing of food and vegetation and all that have made that a very desirable place to live in. The key was prefabrication. We believe that through the economies of prefabrication will solve everything. Turned out that it wasn't as simple. Uh, but today the building is a heritage building. It is certainly a social success in the sense that it's an extremely desirable place to live in, but it did not it did not reproduce itself endlessly all around the world. So the question is, if it did not reproduce, what were the issues involved? Uh, I'll just allow myself that little interlude. It's not quite fits into, uh, or maybe it does. Uh, in, in the late 70s, I think it was 78, I came here with Robin Lowe a Singapore shipbuilder who was dabbling in development, and he purchased this large piece of land, uh, which is today, I believe, known as Rubina. I've not been out there yet. I'm going to look, look at it this afternoon. But at this time, it was a vast open piece of land with some waterways and lagoons. <clears throat> and I was asked to do two things, a master plan, uh, which would develop the appropriate typologies, and to locate within it, uh, it's already been mentioned today as a term, we didn't call it that then, an integrated resort. The idea of hotels, arena for music and sports, convention, and of course, a casino, as part of the uh, central features of this. The plan which uh, evolved was premised on creating a major water work, waterway within this land. Uh, what you see here as the S-shaped canal is the same size and scale and width as Venice's Grand Canal. It cut through the land from one large lagoon towards the, uh, to, to the south to the, what was then planned as the town center. Along the canal, there would be medium density housing. Uh, there'd be some uh, single family houses at the perimeter, and then there would be more concentrated housing around. This was housing along the Grand Canal. 
These were community islands floating in the large lagoon. Uh, around the town center, more dense housing with, lo and behold, it shocked everybody at the time, some high-rise. Um, and finally, for the integrated resort, uh, in the larger lagoon to the, uh, to the north, uh, a series of hotels, casino, arena, some hanging gardens, and all kinds of other entertainment and park-like features, which uh, at the time seemed to be like a reinvention of what an entertainment tourist complex can be like. It's all premised on the license of the casino economically. Robin Lowe was not able to get it as a foreigner, and that was the end of that. He sold the land, somebody else got it, and I'll see what they did with it later. 1973, I had the privilege of traveling to China with Prime Minister Trudeau. This is the father of the current Prime Minister, when he went to open diplomatic relations in, with China. This was Beijing, as I photographed it at the time. Not a single high-rise in Beijing or Shanghai, uh, very few cars, mostly bicycles, uh, a country that has not yet entered the process of urbanization. And this is my own lifetime, uh, actually taken in the about five, six years ago, Beijing today. I mean, urbanization extreme, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, in other words, an extent of urbanism, densification, concentration beyond comprehension. And it raises two questions. One is, all this happened in 40 years, so that whatever, whatever occurred could have taken many forms. It's not a situation where we come and there's a city which is already formed, and we say, what can we do because there's so much already there. Here, there was very little built, and yet, Every mistake we made in the West, in terms of urban development, recurred in Southeast Asia and in China. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, we decided in the office to create a research arm and to go back and revisit Habitat and say, OK, it did not proliferate. What? What could be done different? Let's revisit the whole question of housing and mixed use in the city uh, in the context of what we know today. We were curious, did technology of construction change? Uh, certainly, we were aware of the fact that the densities which we assumed in, uh, in, in the 60s were completely transformed, and there are 10 times and 15 times what, they, what we had assumed they would be uh, uh, in, in the 60s. What emerged out of that uh, series of studies were many different typologies. This is a typology based on vertical construction, prefabricated slabs. It attempts to keep the amenities of gardens and terraces within what is a very simple uh, structural system and achieving medium densities. We looked at housing membranes, which we had explored in earlier years, but with more efficient structures, incorporating uh, uh, spaces which people could actually design themselves as their own houses within a deck system. And one of the studies which I found most informative was to take a case study of Midtown Manhattan. This is Midtown New York. Map its uh, uh, total square footage or square meters of office, apartments, and retail, which you see on the left-hand side. And then reorganize that space into a mixed-use complex, theoretical complex of housing and offices and retail, in which you permit yourself to stack elements three-dimensionally. And this was the emerging system, which had several premises. One is that you create, around the 25th floor, 
a connective street that zones between, say, offices and housing. Secondly, that you take advantage of the massing and the height uh, so that you place the offices on the lower levels and the housing at the upper levels. And third, this comes to the edge concept. You come up with a typology that does not create walls, but rather porous enough that you could build it along rivers and beaches and seas without the city behind it uh, feeling that a barrier had been created. And so this is 75 floors. It is the identical density of Midtown Manhattan, an average FAR of 12. Many, many of the units had terraces and gardens. There were generous public spaces within the, the deck area and street areas in the structure. And as we terminated this, we found that we were into the possibility that some of these concepts could be applied to our practice, uh, to actual commissions. And the first one to come interested in what we had explored was a commission from the Kerry Group, the, those who own Shangri-La, for a project in Qingwandao, China, a coastal city near Beijing, uh, to achieve a very high density for income, middle, middle income housing in an area along the coast where there was sensitivity to the blockage of the development that already occurred behind. And while it took us a while to get all the permits and approvals, this opened three years ago and has been extremely successful living community. Uh, again, we have the streets that connect at mid-level. Uh, we have terracing and outdoor spaces. Um, the individual deck gardens, private deck gardens for the units and the communal spaces as well. Another project which I present with the emphasis that it is middle income housing uh, in Singapore was what was nicknamed Sky Habitat. 600 units in the outskirts, not downtown, not a luxury site, of family living, high-rise living. This is not HDB housing for those who know Singapore, which is the government-sponsored public housing, but the private sector middle-income housing, uh, which is uh, privately financed. And the complex was organized into three deck levels, which are communal spaces with playgrounds and parks and uh, community rooms, uh, each 15 floors, which you see here, uh, the top one being a swimming pool, and with terracing and balconies, a building that's completely cross-ventilated and in which all the service spaces, including bathrooms and kitchens, are naturally ventilated. The life and activities in the public spaces uh, demonstrate that this has really resonated, and this family is primarily accommodate, this building is primarily accommodating families with lots of young children. Mixed use in the public realm and the public realm take us to another level of complexity. And let me begin with talking about the typology. In fact, some of it you see outside of this uh, convention center but the most extreme cases you see in the mega cities uh, of, of Asia, Latin America. Pro developers get large pieces of lands, as large as they can assemble. They build on them two, three, four towers of different uses, and they generally set it up on a podium, which then is a mall, shopping center, mall, whatever you call it. It is introvert, generally, it is multi-level, it is cut off from the surrounding city, it siphons off energy off the street, and it's completely privatized. It's controlled in every way as a private space. It's generally dedicated to one thing, commerce. And so that's become the prevailing uh, place where many people spend uh, life in cities. Uh, even when these... Uh, Projects are more ambitious, and without going into names, uh, 
assign some of the leading architects, the approach is essentially the same. There's a podium, there's several towers, they're designed independently of each other. There's no sense of co co things coalescing or certainly no connectivity to the city. So much of what we've been doing in this area has been to explore the possibility that you can meet these programs and you can meet those densities in a way that is, A, connective to the city, that it supports the quality of publicness of the spaces, and in time, perhaps, uh, be regulated in a way that their programming in terms of what's uses in them and the activities when the, in them are truly public. And the first opportunity for us, again, uh, unexpectedly, I would say, was Marina Bay Sands in Singapore, which is an integrated resort. It was a result of a lengthy competition of developers, each with their own architect, with a difference, however, to many such programs. The tender by the government of Singapore stipulated that the price of the land would be fixed, and they would award the contract to the developer and architectural team that offered the most to Singapore. And the criteria were uh, the financial strength and the programming contribution to tourism, but 50% was design and urban design contribution to the city. And the guidelines of the URA were quite specific. They talked about creating a public promenade along the bay. They created about a series of spaces which would be truly public within the project. And they talked about 50% of the roof area within the complex as accessible parks and gardens. I want to refer <coughs> to what was, for me, the springing point of thinking about Marina Bay. Unlikely, but anyhow, that the way. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the Byzantine, the Madaba plan of Byzantine Jerusalem. And as every Roman city of the time, or Byzantine city of the time, it had the Cardo Maximus in its center, and the Decaminus crossing it, and this was the main drag. And that was the spine of the city. This goes back to Robina, because the idea of a Grand Canal was that the development of that scale needs a spine, and the canal was trying to provide a spine to Robina. This is more of an urban spine, and in Roman cities, all the major public buildings plugged into that spine. And so, we knew of the city requirement to have a promenade, which you see here along the water, in the left diagram. We knew that to satisfy our own uh, program and cluster conventions and theaters and shopping and museum, we needed some kind of a spine. Uh, we integrated the two into an indoor-outdoor, partially air-conditioned, partially open to nature, new kind of urban place. And by definition, each direction connected to the city streets and the city circulation system. So that rather than be introverted, it was completely extrovert. Each tip of it connected to something the city provided in leading into the project. I should say that this would not have occurred without both the conceptual contribution and then policing that by the URA, Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore. This, to me, convinced me that to really get developers, even if they have the most willing architects and, and enlightened architects working for them, you need the regulatory power of a planning authority which sets things like that as a priority, because we would have never lost our battles without that kind of, won our battles without that kind of support. And so here you have moving from outside, inside, the promenade along the water, a heavily used space at night. There are events there, there are thousands of people uh, all over the place. It's a completely comprehensive part of the city, 
And as it moves inbound, you've got air-conditioned space. They're filled with light. The part of the outside as well. So you move indoor, outdoor seamlessly. And even the hotel complex with its own series of atria are truly public. They're open 24 hours a day, and the public parades through them like it is a regular street in the city it, as it all intertwines. And then as a kind of what occurred as a late moment invention, we had these three towers. We had a whole major component of our program, unsatisfied, swimming pools, gardens, all kinds of things that would make it like resort. And there was no more space. And it was that point, the model in the workshop at the office was sitting there, that there was a big piece of plywood and it just, uh, it just occurred, I pick it up and put it on top and said, well, why don't we just put it on top? That's two and a half acres. Four days later, the client said, are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> but it caught on and it demonstrates that you can have extraordinary outdoor public experience. Um, there's pools, there's an observatory, there's restaurants, and uh, great swimming. And who knows, next week we might... <laughs> They're clearing the pool, <laughs> getting ready. <coughs> One of the components of the uh, call for proposal was that there should be a cultural building on the promontory, which is so uh, visible from every part of the city. And since Singapore seemed to have so well endowed with everything, they have museum, science museum, aquariums, you name it, we invented something new, the Museum of Art Science. And we proposed this museum where science and art are integrated into a singular subject, and it's actually been quite a successful and, and unexpected place. I want to show you a couple more projects in which this level of complexity seems to increase, I'd say even the level of density. We were called in to look at a very prominent site, the triangular end, it's where the city was born, so I should call it the beginning rather than end, of the city of Chongqing. I have to confess, when I was called in to review this project, I said, where is Chongqing? I had no idea. Uh, how many here have heard of, know about Chongqing? That's the biggest city in the world, 38 million people, and we have a handful of arms. So that's a reality uh, of, of the rate of change of China. The brown river is the Yangtze, and the blue river is the Jialing, and the meeting point has been traditionally the great shipping center of central China. So the city fathers, um, or leadership, more appropriately, uh, was considering how to rebuild around the piazza that they have created. You can see the piazza is already existing there, uh, looking down river, a very large complex that would form a gateway-like place to the city. But again, it's the same program, eight towers, housing, offices, hotels, two million square feet, uh, 200,000 square meters of retail. And as you know, in China, if you just present a project without a little theme story, you, they don't get it. So you've got to have a good story, like a bird's nest is a good story. Um, and so what would we do at the tip of the site? And we realized that it's always been the shipping center of China, <clears throat> and the ships, this is one of them, that went up and down the Yangtze, where these great sail ships, there's still, still some of them there, and so I doodled a kind of a bunch of towers that seemed to be moving like a sail ship, and we got stuck with this. So um, 
we have clustered the towers in such a way that they are shaped and bent in a way that implies their movement downriver with sunscreens that actually uh, uh, evoke the sense of sails. But more seriously, we, we stitch them together or inter interwove them together at the 50th level with an in a conservatory, which again created a vast public space uh, for all kinds of amenities and connecting the towers. Moreover, we had to find a way in which the whole set, the podium of the complex, which you see is massive here, becomes really part of the public realm. And so we achieved that in two ways. We made sure that the galleries in the podium are an extension of the street system of the city. So each of these arrows, which are streets, and as they enter the project, we reroute the traffic and let pedestrians go right through to the plaza uh, on the opposite side. That's the red line in the section as it descends from the city to the, to the river level. But because the site is sloping, from that same point, if you stay level, a slightly ascending, the green line, it is the roof of the podium. And it was designed and will be a public park accessible to the city as a whole. So that what we get is two networks, one which extends the streets, and becomes internal and then emerges again to the plaza. And we get the park system on the roof, which is part of the scope of the city. And then on top of it, we also get the 50th level public promenade. So this is one of the streets as it enters the project and it gets to be roofed and air conditioned and then emerges to the plaza. And there are three such paths that, that form the movement through the project uh, from public space to public space. Facing south, we have the residential development with its terracing, and this is the roof of the podium, which is public park with fountains and all kinds of uh, amenities to attract people to it. The reason for the conservatory, rather than, say, an open park system, is because the climate in Chongqing is both the climate and pollution make for very difficult uh, uh, conditions climatically. There's a very, very hot summer, 40 degrees plus, humid. There's a cold winter, there's pollution galore, and I think it has less. This is sunshine state, so Chongqing must be the rainy state. Uh, there's at least sunlight uh, days than any other place in China. And so we created this cross-sectional envelope of glazing and shading within which a whole variety of things occur. And here it is under construction about a year before opening. They're just putting up the conservatory and there's a great deal of excitement emerging in the city. In Toronto, which is kind of a more urban, familiar condition, right at the downtown, we're also we're asked to look at a very dense concentration of housing, offices, and retail. And the more you are into the existing fabric of the city, the tougher the assignment becomes. Because here you are into the grid of what is a 19th century city. It would be like some of the parts of Melbourne and, or, or Sydney, particularly Melbourne, and actually Toronto is very much like Melbourne. Uh, and we uh, achieved remarkable density on a relatively small site while maintaining the existing street system just running openly through the project. So you can see the section the streets run through, and above that hovering and building up with increasing density towards the upper levels, housing and uh, office structure, and some horizontal public spaces. They, again, the objective has been to take the podium and make that into a series of public gardens and parks accessible by elevator, elevators from all around the surrounding streets, this being 
the, the park system on the fourth floor of the complex, which is under the towers. And a couple more evolutions. These are not yet, uh, this is not yet built. It's a complex in, uh, in Seoul. It is mixed use, but here there's an added uh, dimension, which it's actually showing us that the horizontal park and the linkage is becoming part of a new typology. This evolved because the client had seen Marina Bay and wanted to go further. They are the biggest food producer in Korea. They wanted to create the opportunity for urban agriculture as part of the program. Two of these large sky parks are devoted to agriculture, the others to public amenities. There's a large podium as well, which is devoted to agriculture. This is an extraordinarily ambitious cross section with 18 floors of manufacturing underground, parking, retail, convention, and above that, a series of towers, altogether 1.2 million, million square feet, but you have these outdoor spaces and the agricultural roof parks where intensive agriculture will be occurring. And the last project I want to show, which is nearing completion, was very significant to me personally because it opened up the door to, to explore what is the character and nature of public place possible if you go back and rethink it from first principle. This is a complex called Jewel. It's the center of Changi Airport in Singapore. It is positioned between the three existing terminals, and the idea is that it creates a major center that connects them all. The train that connects the terminals runs right through it, and at the same time, the idea is that this will serve passengers and airport employees, but it will also serve the citizens at large. It sits over the subway, access is excellent, and the program said retail, airport facilities, etc., and an attraction. The, this is a private-public sector partnership, so each developer had to come with an attraction, then Changi would choose one and become partners. We were working with Capital Land, and the first idea was, of course, aquariums, dinosaurs, universal. You got a couple of them down the road here. Just a big amusement thing. It seemed to me that that is time-limited, something that gets dated, that is not universal enough as an attraction for an urban place. And so I made a counter-proposal of creating a magical garden which would attract everybody and would have all kinds of interesting things for young people to do in it, but the garden just the same. And so you see here in the cross section this large glass toroidal dome. There's a valley garden and a plateau under it that descends, and under it, with light penetrating through, are four levels of retail surrounding that, and below that, airport facilities and parking and a whole world of airport services. But this is kind of the light diagram. The light comes down uh, from above through the shopping levels as they surround, as well as comes down all the way to the lowest levels in the center. Because the roof is a toroid, the entire roof area drains inbound. And as it comes to the vortex, it becomes a waterfall. There's no structure there, it's just the water going down. It's actually a hanging structure. And that water on a rainy Singapore afternoon is 10,000 gallons a minute, which gets collected and recycled and used. And so this is pretty well the way it's getting built. Uh, all the trees are waiting to go in in nurseries around Singapore. Some of them come from Australia. Uh, there are many attractions in it designed by the Exploratorium Science Museum in, in San Francisco. 
for the young people at various levels, um, and there's trails and so on, and there's a complete separation between the garden experience and the shopping experience, except from time to time, the bazaar, the marketplace, has glimpses into the garden and vice versa. But everybody recognizes that if you mix the bazaar with the garden, you get neither. So there is an intense market-like place atmosphere. And what excites me about that is that there is in this the seeds of a model of what public places in the city can be. I mean, we are so conditioned by these, well, if I can say, awful malls, uh, often deprived of daylight, often confusing in their orientation, very single use, just shopping, no mix of civic and culture and shopping as cities used to be. And, and I think we are, there is a, there's a thirst and a quest for a kind of public space that's more uplifting. For one thing is, yes, we want air conditioning, but when we live in climates which have good seasons and beautiful weather, we want to be outdoors. We want spaces that can convert from winter to summer and so on and so forth. So to me, in Jewel, there is that kind of a seed of coming up with a new kind of public realm of which nature plays a fundamental role. Here it is nearing completion. It's been quite an engineering feat, but that, will, that I'll talk about some other time. Um, just a couple of words in conclusion. I'm often asked uh, what inspires me most as an architect. It's a favorite uh, jour journalistic question. And my response is, I'm most inspired by the design of nature. That while we learn a lot from the work of architects before us, and I particularly learned from architects, without architects, to go back to Bernard Rudowski's famous exhibition and book, Vernacular Architecture, which didn't even involve architects, where there's so much to learn in terms of the evolution of architecture. But in design in nature, you understand how fitness and fitness to purpose uh, achieves extraordinary beauty just through evolution. This is the wing, the x-ray through the wing of a, of a dove, and you see that matrix of, of uh, bones that gives it maximum strength uh, with minimum weight, and if you saw that cross-section roofing a stadium, you'd say, what an amazing feat of engineering. Or the geometries of the nautilus shell. Uh, I'm always inspired by any form of nature that transforms uh, seasonally or through cycles of its life. I mean, the adaptation to changing seasons, which architecture is only at the, at the infancy of beginning to cope with. The changing seasons are an amazing opportunity for architecture to transform, to open up, to create outdoor terraces which enclose, which open up, which shade, which let the sun in. And so this is a kind of fitness that one aspires for, or, or the extraordinary efficiency and elegance of, a, of the spider web, which is the only geometry one could conceive of as being woven in the kind of sequence that, that, uh, and geometry that, that's possible for, for the spider. So fitness, fitness, just trying to respond to the program of a building in its broader sense. I don't like the word function. I think it's too limiting. I like the word purpose because it includes program or brief as it's called in in, in some places, the climate, the materiality of architecture, all of which coalesce into some kind of exquisite fitness, which is the root and source of all beauty. Thank you very much.